Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Do we have any greetings or announcements today? Thank you, Brother George. Brother George Miklia brings greetings from Ohio for the Melovantsevs and from his own family there. It's good to be back, and he is appreciative of all support. Thank you. Next Saturday, after spring cleaning. So just to tie that in, uh, Brother Sam, do you have an announcement about spring cleaning? Next week, be here. So uh, there is spring cleaning next week. Uh, please uh, feel free. You're encouraged to come and to help uh, do spring cleaning. Uh, Brother Steve and Sister Adina. Uh, saying greetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Her mother sends uh, greetings. Okay, Brother David, we keep uh, you, Brother Eric, and Brother David are going to be out of town next week. Keep them in prayer. Brandon's mom and brother send greetings. Brother Zora, nothing. Okay, Sister Marilyn Lukic sends greetings, and uh, Sister Donka and Lorraine, Sister Lorene are in Fresno. They send greetings. Choir practice at 1240. Uh, choir practice at 1240. Be on time. Be on time. Brother Jonathan has set a stellar example, and we uh, we'll, should follow that. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, Brother Jovan and Sister Slobodanka and Yasmina are going to be out of town next week. Keep them in your prayers. So, uh, indeed, uh, spring cleaning is on the 16th. That's next weekend. Um, All California Choir is on the 31st. So I think that's three weekends from now, if I'm not mistaken. So keep that in mind. All California Choir... Saturday practice is going to be at, uh, is that 1 p.m.? Saturday practice uh, is going to be at 1 p.m. And uh, on October 30th, the program will be on Sunday. And then uh, La Pointe will be having big things. So that's going to be a a full day for us here. Keep that in your prayers and on your calendars. Um, Also, uh, we are starting to collect for the two meals for the California Choir. Please earmark your donations accordingly. And remember that everyone is to bring two desserts. Very good. Uh, Greetings from Sister Elizabeth Moore, uh, Brother Dam and Sister Danielle Pitacaru. They are in Ohio. Uh, Brother Steve and Sister Ida Terzik and Sister Julie Kale. I'll send greetings. Uh, Our prayer request list is in the weekly bulletin, so be sure to, to look at that. If there's nothing else, then we would, uh, Brother Tim would be serving us this morning. Please keep him in your prayers. All right. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone, again. Thank you. All right. Before we read the word, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, please help us to focus right now on the truth that's before us. Please help us to acknowledge where we don't fully trust you. Please help us to be honest with ourselves as we look into this passage that you inspired Paul to write to Timothy, to encourage him to forsake the pursuit of covetousness and materialism and to rather focus on you the way that you prescribed us to live and to find joy and contentment in that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage for this morning is in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, verses 5 through 19. 1 Timothy 6, verses 5 through 19. 
The title for this message is In Money We Trust. In Money We Trust. I find it somewhat ironic that printed on our U.S. money is the phrase In God We Trust. And, you know, people can argue for good reason, bad reason, that's printed on our money, but nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that it's on the money. But I kind of find it ironic, especially given how materialistically driven our culture is. Right? As we're counting our money, ironically, that phrase is on there, and God we trust, and yet it's really the money that we're, that we're putting our trust in. And I'm going to use we, you know, I'm going to say first person plural, um, to the extent that you can relate with, with me, right? That's what that we embraces. So I don't mean to implicate anyone or, or say that this is how you think. Um, in many respects, this is a message for myself. And so uh, I'll be the first to raise my hand in the struggle with some of these, these nuances of, of the trust that we may place in money. But as I was brainstorming titles for this message, I was thinking like financial refocus or investing strategies 101. But my sarcastic nature kind of led me to that title, In Money We Trust. And I think, again, I, we, buy, buy into that lie so easily that money is something that we can or should trust. That's what our culture, that's what, there's this, a huge current. If there's a current in anything, there's a huge current in that direction. And I think we'd be quick to say, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. No, I, it's in God I trust. But if we would analyze our pursuit of contentment, our pursuit of security, of, of purpose, of meaning, how, how often is it that money, things, materialism are more so at the focus than God and his ways? Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 24. This is the Sermon on the Mount, right? A famous, a number of like short sayings that Jesus probably circulated in, in, in his sermons and, and teachings. And, and we find this verse, Matthew 6, 24, in context of charitable giving, a context of sincere worship to God, and a context of trusting in God, right? All these things are kind of wrapped in here. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and money, right? And I think it's, it's pretty clear, this, the mutual exclusivity of these two pursuits. You can't be selfishly hoarding stuff and at the same time, generously distributing, right? You can't be so worried and consumed and focused on your own concerns and interests while at the same time being interested in the concerns and interests of others. You can't love and pursue wealth and at the same time be disposed to God and his purposes. And Jesus lays that out real clearly, right? You can't serve God and money. But again, sometimes we as Christians think that, well, Jesus sets up this mutual exclusivity. It's either you love God or you love money. And it's almost like there's no middle ground. So as a Christian, I say, well, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ, and therefore I love God. So by definition, I don't love money. Right? I, I, I just, it, it's just like a, a fact of, of the matter that I love God, and therefore I don't love money. So none of my pursuits in life are really motivated by money, just by virtue of the fact that I call myself as a Christian. And, and maybe you don't you know, succumb to that kind of naive way of thinking, but I think, at least I'll think that, that sometimes I, I almost like I'm fooling myself. It's, it's naive to object to what Christ is saying, or not to object, but to rather justify my life and my actions to fit within the framework that Jesus has, has established here. And I say, I love God, therefore I'm not motivated by money because I'm a Christian. And I think that's a little naive. I think we're kind of fooling ourselves because so many times money, not God, is what we're really trusting in. And I'll, again, I'll be the first to raise my hand, first to admit. So what do we do? Let's read what Paul has to say to Timothy. I think there's a lot of wisdom here that God inspired Paul to, to instruct Timothy. And hopefully we can come away with some truths that will dispel the lies of what money can and cannot buy. So 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 5, Paul just got done warning Timothy of these false teachers, these false teachers who suppose that godliness, I'll put that in quotes, because it's not real godliness, they suppose that this form of godliness is a means of gain. Verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment or clothing, let us therewith be content. But they... 
that will be richer, they that desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. While which some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, or gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, or or gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they, meet, that they be not high-minded or haughty or proud, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate or to share laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. There's a lot in that passage, um, and I'm going to try to break it down because I think Paul provides a good argument as to why it's not money in which we should trust, but rather it's in God. So Paul starts out here. Again, he just finished Timothy he just finished warning Timothy about these false teachers, right? And he, and, he, and he further tells Timothy to steer clear of these money-hungry temptations that seemingly drive a lot of these false teachers. And we still have that today. And I've mentioned this, and I'll continue to mention it. It's, it's disgusting how people get rich off the gospel. It's a despicable use of the gospel, the truth of God's word, to get rich. Because invariably, how that takes place is those False teachers, those preachers, take advantage of others who are financially worse off. And they slyly manipulate their audience to give to their ministries, which primarily consists of big houses, boats, and planes, and those kinds of things. Yeah, they're they're speaking truth, they're preaching the word, but ironically, they're making millions. And it's an unfortunate... It's an unfortunate state of, of some of these false teachers, because... And some of these preachers, and maybe they're preaching the truth, but there's a super dr- big drive of this money-hungry, basically their God is their stomach kind of motivation. Seeking what they can consume. And so Paul, in contrast to that, he describes a better way of life. In one way or another, Paul has mentioned ideas such as like contentment or security or purpose in this passage that we just read. And they kind of are inter- interrelated and overlap. And I think to say it in a phrase, this is maybe, I don't know if you want to call it the, the, the thesis of, of this, but a, a rephrasing of verse 6, if you will. We find contentment and security in God as we live out our purpose in Him. We find contentment, we find security in God as we live out our purpose in Him. Let me say this uh, maybe a little bit differently or more generally. Whether you acknowledge it or not, In life, you seek out contentment. You seek out joy. You seek out things that will satisfy you. In life, you will seek out security in some form or another. The the idea of feeling safe, the idea of maybe coming to a home. In life, you will seek to have meaning or some sort of purpose. And people pursue these things in all different ways, shapes, and sizes. And the warning that's provided here is specifically in this context is don't search that. Don't try to find that contentment, security, and purpose in a pursuit of money or materialism. That's the warning that's here. And instead, Paul says that we find our contentment and security in God as we live out our purpose in Him. Or That's kind of a rephrasing of verse 6. He says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Right? That's the claim, that's the thesis that Paul is going to develop now. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Godliness can sometimes be an elusive word. I often refer to Jerry Bridges' book, The Pursuit of Godliness. He has a really simple definition, I think, that is pretty clear. He says that godliness is devotion to God that results in a life that is pleasing to him. Devotion to God. I think that's a key word, devotion. Devotion to God that results in a life that's pleasing to him. That's what godliness is. And then contentment, I think it's a pretty basic word. right? Contentment means you're satisfied with what you currently have. You're satisfied. So Paul combines these two things. He says, when we have a life that's devoted to God and we're content with that, Paul is saying having those two things together, that's great gain. And it's great gain in contrast to the monetary gain that's driving some of these false teachers. So that's the contrast that Paul is painting here or that, that Paul is trying to argue. Paul says in verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And if you're familiar with Job, that's really similar. kind of echoes what Job says after Job loses everything. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. Right? You came with nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. And at first inspection, it's like, okay, it's an obvious statement, Paul, thank you. But, you know... What does that really do? It doesn't, it doesn't really convince me that godliness with contentment is, is great gain. I know I didn't bring anything. I, didn't, I know I didn't bring anything into this world, right? I, I know I was born a baby. I know that all of that was, was, was given to me to, to bring me to where I'm at. And I know full well that despite how much money or resources or whatever that I amass, that when I die, I can't take it with me. So it's like... I get what you're saying, Paul, but it doesn't really address my desire, which is I don't care my starting point or ending point. I care about in between, right? That's why I want money now. I want money to enjoy. I want materialism. I want things to enjoy now. And so I, I almost like object to what Paul says. I'm going to be arguing with Paul and myself here as I, as I go through this. I object to what Paul says, saying that that doesn't answer my question. That doesn't answer my concern. Right? I, I don't care about when I die because at that point I don't need security or contentment. I'm dead. But I think Paul starts this way, and I think my objection to what Paul is saying is missing something here. Paul starts this way because there's, a, there's an implication. He says, it is certain we can carry nothing out. There's an implication there that when we die, it's not the end. Yeah, we cannot carry material things beyond this life, but the point is not the fact that we can't carry things beyond this life. The fact of the matter is that there is a life, right? There is a life after death. That's what Paul is pointing at here, and that's what we'll eventually get into in terms of investing in that, that life after death. He is directing our attention at this point, very gently but sincerely, directing our attention to that part of our existence that will, much, that will last much longer. And so, and so Paul says, in the meantime, while you're, you know, that, the dash, if you will, right, between your birth date and your end date, right, that period of time, he says in verse 8, having food and clothing... With these, we shall be content. Those things that we absolutely need. Food, shelter, clothing. Right? Let's be satisfied with these. But I want to object to 10. I don't, I don't like that. And it, seems, it seems like the bare necessities. I don't want just the bare necessities. I don't want to eat just plain oatmeal. I want to have some maybe sugar and cinnamon or brown sugar and raisins with my oatmeal and some other things. Right? I, I want there to be a little bit of flavor there. I don't want to just get by with bare necessities. And so I, I, I invariably ask the question, well, is it wrong then to have more than just these bare necessities of, of food and clothing? Is it wrong? And I, I take a look around at other Christians. I take a look around at other people. Oh, they have this. They have that. They seem to be respected among others. They seem to have a decent head on their shoulders. Is it wrong for me to have that too? No. And so I go my merry way kind of pursuing or acquiring or, or whatever it is. But maybe the question of whether it's right or wrong is the wrong question. Consider this as, as a comparison. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is explaining to the Corinthians his heart of evangelism, how he becomes one to another person just to spread the gospel, right? And in that chapter, he makes reference to Peter who took on, or who, who has a believing wife. Peter's married. And Paul's like, don't I have a right to be married too? I mean, can't, isn't that within the, the moral 
confines or the moral constraints of, of God that I can have a wife too? It's not wrong for me to have a wife. Right? Why can't I have a wife? He also says, is it not right for me actually to, to, to have some payment for my ministry among you? It's, you don't muzzle the ox while it treads the corn, right? He even, he even backs it up. Like there's, there's a reasonable expectation. It's within the moral framework of God that Paul can easily exact payment for his evangelistic church planting duties. He's working. He's a hard worker. But even more so, he's working on the side of the tent maker to compensate for that so he doesn't burden those to whom he's preaching. But Paul makes the argument that it's not wrong for him to take on a believing wife. It's not wrong for him to take you know, payment for his preaching. So maybe the question isn't about like right or wrong, but rather Paul says this, or he doesn't say this, but this is what he expresses, right? He has this conviction. He has, he has this mission to preach the gospel. And the question in his mind, is not, it's not right or wrong whether he can do these things. His mind is kind of focused elsewhere. It's about his mission, it's about his calling, his conviction. And so maybe the question when we consider money is that oftentimes we go about it the wrong way because we ask that question, well, is it right or wrong? Is it a sin to, and then we kind of fill in the blank. And that kind of thought process, it might be a good exercise in some respects, but we need to be careful because that's a very legalistic approach to how we live our lives. And so maybe the question is not, well, can I have more than food and clothing or shelter? Can I have more than those bare necessities? Is that right or wrong? Maybe that's not the right question. Maybe the question is, why do we want more? Why is it that we're not content with those things? Why is it that we want more? And when we ask that question, maybe that's going to reveal something about where we are placing our trust for contentment and security. Continuing on in verse 9, Paul says, But those who desire to be rich those who desire, they fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love, you know, he's talking about our affections, he's talking about our desires, he's talking about what we're pursuing. Our love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierces, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Not mincing words here. Paul lays it out pretty, pretty cut and dry. This lust for money and materialism, this, this greed that he mentions here, this avarice, this covetousness, this envy, those things wreak havoc in our lives and our relationships. And they distort our perception of reality. In some cases, so much to the point that some have departed from the truth that they have known. They've departed from the faith. I think I've shared this quote in the past but I think it's extremely appropriate given what Paul says. Benjamin Franklin said this, money never made a man happy yet, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more a man has, the more he wants. Instead of its filling a vacuum, it makes one. If it satisfies one want, it doubles that want in another way. That was a true proverb of the wise man. Rely upon it. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. And he's quoting Proverbs 15, 16. Verse 6 of 1 Timothy 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord. I think extremely parallel in the truth that's being proclaimed here. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Covetousness, greed, a love for money, a love to be rich comes with a lot of baggage that we don't want. It's interesting, in Romans 7, 7, Paul is, is explaining to the Romans how he acutely became aware of sin in his life. And he says, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not covet. Now, it's interesting. Of all the different commands that Paul could have cited there, he chose covetousness. I don't know the exact reason, but a thought is this. You can't run from covetousness in terms of justifying yourself, right? Despite how upright Paul appeared in external adherence to the law, 
Okay, he didn't kill anybody. He didn't sleep with someone, right? He didn't, whatever. He kind of list things off in terms of this external adherence to the law. Covetousness cuts to the heart, right? You don't wear covetous. You don't do covetous on the outside. Maybe it manifests in certain ways for sure. But ultimately, covetousness is in the heart. And I think that's something that Paul probably wrestled with. Maybe that was what he was kicking against the pricks, right? He knew that something was wrong in his life. And it touched his motives, his affections, his desires, what his pursuit and his love was, this covetousness. Maybe he suffered with it, maybe he didn't. But he specifically says here in Romans 7, I know sin because of the law says don't, don't covet. And he fell short of that. So to whatever extent, we don't know. But that's what Paul says in Romans 7, 7. And maybe, maybe it, it touched Paul really deep. Because in Colossians 3, 5, we see that Paul equates covetousness covetousness to idolatry that he realized the depth of this sin it's not just like oh don't covet your neighbors whatever but this amounts to idolatry why because you're 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 putting something above and beyond god in terms of your pursuit for contentment in terms of your pursuit for satisfaction i want this to be satisfied therefore i covet this jesus said this in luke 16 he just got done saying you can't serve God and, and money. Luke 16, starting with verse 14. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And then Jesus says to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And what is Jesus referring to here? He's referring to this love of money. He's referring to his popular applause. He's referring to his adoration of men that these Pharisees were seeking. In Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. We hear that, we know it, but do we actually believe it? Is it in money that we trust, or is it in God that we trust? Mark 8, 36, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And that idea of this amassing great wealth. And, and maybe it's not great wealth like relative to who, you know, it doesn't matter. But just the idea of this wanting more and more and more, building bigger barns, that kind of idea. When I thought about that, um, I thought of one of Aesop's fables. It's called The Miser. It's short, so I'll read it. I think it's applicable. A miser sold everything he had and melted down his hoard of gold into a single lump, which he buried secretly in a field. Every day he went to look at it and would sometimes spend long hours gloating over his treasure. One of his men noticed his frequent visits to the spot and one day watched him and discovered his secret. Awaiting his opportunity, he went one night and dug up the gold and stole it. The next day, the miser visited the place as usual, and finding his treasure gone, he fell to tearing his hair and groaning over his loss. In this condition, he was seen by one of his neighbors, who asked him what, is his, what his trouble was. The miser told him of his misfortune, but the other replied, Don't take it so much to heart, my friend. Put a brick in the hole and take a look at it every day. You won't, be, you won't be any worse off than before. For even when you had your gold, it was of no earthly use to you. And the moral of the story clearly is the true value of money is not just amassing it or just possessing it, right? But it's in its use. But that fable only goes so far. Okay, it's in its use, so I'm going to spend it on myself. Great. I'm not going to be a miser and just bury some big bar of gold and, you know, gloat over it all day and just like oogle it and, and love it and stroke it, right? I'm going to spend that money. How? How ought we to use our resources, our money, our time, that kind of thing? And I think that the rest of this passage helps answer that, where Aesop kind of left us off. So verse 11, 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But you, O man, flee these things. So flee the desire to be rich, flee the love of money, because those things result in, in this bad news. And instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 
to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. There is a conscious choice that we need to make. There is a reason why God inspired Paul to write this letter to Timothy, because there is a temptation there. There is a, 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 rea there is a, a, a realistic possibility to get off course and off track. And so Paul is reminding Timothy to help him, to encourage him. Don't get lulled to sleep. Don't be, don't be deceived by these lies of pursuing materialism and money, like some of these false teachers that are doing this in Ephesus. So instead, pursue these things. Make a conscious choice to meditate on these truths, to seek godliness with contentment, to seek upright behavior, to seek um, this devotion to God, right? To trust him, to love him, to love others. This is your calling, he says to Timothy, right? This is what you were called for. This is your fight. Fight this kind of fight. It's interesting. I mean, fight's not a nice word, right? But I think if you couch it in context of like fighting for righteousness and love and gentleness and goodness, then we can get, kind of get over that term. But it's a call to action, right? It, it's, an, it's a, it's a, there's a term of urgency there. This is the fight that we're supposed to fight. This is the fight that Timothy was supposed to fight, one of patience and gentleness and love towards others. But so, so many times, I think Christians get wrapped up in, in different fights, ones that are maybe more financially driven or more, maybe more politically driven than they are biblically driven. And we need to check ourselves in terms of, do I use the Bible as a reference to support this whatever fight that I'm fighting? Or do I fight because this is what the Bible says I ought to fight for? And again, look at the words that Paul is using here describing the fight that Timothy um, is supposed to fight, this fight to, to pursue the calling that Timothy is supposed to pursue. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. That's the Christian fight. In Micah 6, 8, God says to Micah, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You think about that. To do justice or to do justly, to be equitable, to be fair, right, in your dealings with other people. But then it moves to love mercy. Mercy is something that you give. Right? Instead of exacting payment, instead of exacting justice that you think that or you may legitimately deserve, instead of exacting that from somebody and taking that from them, you're actually giving. Mercy is a generous offer. It's a giving. We are to love that and to walk in humility with our God. I think this is living with a purpose wherein we will find contentment. As Paul continues in verse 13 and following, I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, right, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, blameless, right, until the Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he, God, will manifest in his own time, who is the blessed the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in light, unapproachable light, right? Whom no man can see nor has seen, to whom be honor and everlasting power, amen. I definitely want to develop verses 15 and 16 because there's a lot there, but that's, a, that's another time. But just a few comments on this passage here. So up until this point in time, Paul has, has mentioned twice this good confession. If you look in verse 12, he says that, Timothy, you made a good confession before the presence of many witnesses. And then in verse 13, he references Jesus making this good confession. Timothy made the good confession in terms of who Christ is. Jesus made the good confession of who he was, right, um, before others. And so both of these are the same good confession of who Christ actually is. And so I think part of the argument that Paul is making here of this godliness with contentment is that it, it connects with this good confession. It's, it's not separate from it. That as I make this good confession, I publicly acknowledge before others in my actions, in my words, in my thoughts, in my demonstration, right, that Jesus is who he is, that there is a contentment to be had there. What do I mean by that? Paul says this. Oh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. 
Paul says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a great thing to put on a coffee mug or to write in a card or whatever, right? And, and people love that verse. Um, it's a great verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's the context in which Paul made that claim, though? This is the interesting thing. In Philippians 4, verse 11, a couple verses back, Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I have learned in whatever state that I am to be content. How, Paul? What is your secret? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This good confession of who Christ is isn't, isn't as much, I would say, as a public confession as it is more of a, of a, like a speaking to others as, as, as much as it is a speaking to oneself. That we, when we recognize who Christ is, and it's a, it's a great thing to go through the Bible to see what are all the titles of, of Jesus? What are all the titles of, of the Messiah, of Christ? And what do those mean? Think of, think of this. Christ is called the light of the world, right? To give us vision, to, give us, to, give, to help us to see reality as it really is, right? To see clearly. Jesus is referred to as the spiritual walk in Corinthians. The spiritual rock, as referenced in Corinthians. Um, well, that, that's kind of... It's the spiritual rock that's, that's referenced in Corinthians, pointing back to when Israel was wandering around the wilderness, right? That, that rock from which Israel drank. That was the idea there. That slaked their thirst. He was the satisfaction of them in, 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 a, in a desert land. Jesus is called the spiritual rock. He's called the good shepherd in John, right? That'll lead his sheep in good pasture and he'll protect them. He'll lay his life down for them. Jesus is referred to as the Lord and our Savior. He's referred to as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To me, that connotes security, right? If someone is the beginning and the end, they know what's going to go down and they know how everything is going to play out. And so I think therein I'll find security, not in money, not in uncertain riches, but rather it's in God we ought to trust. Jesus is referred to as the way, the truth, and the life. Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content because he knew who Christ was. And that's why he could do all things like this impossible thing of being content in any state that he finds himself because it is Christ who strengthens him. I think that's, that's part of that good confession. But then Paul moves on. It's almost like this, like he couldn't help himself just to amplify the majesty of God. And so he does that. He elaborates on the majesty of God in verses 15 and 16. And he provides for us this very high view of God, an accurate view of who God is, dwelling in unapproachable light, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, you know, the only sovereign ruler. When we have a high view of God, that puts our lives in its proper, accurate context. And look at this argument that the author of Hebrews makes. Almost the exact same as what Paul is laying out here to Timothy. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, right? The same imperative, the same command that Paul is giving Timothy. Be content. Don't, don't let your life be, be run over with covetousness, okay? So let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself, for God himself has said, this is who God is, having a high view, an accurate view of God. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? When we have an accurate confession of who Christ is and a high view of who God is, we can find repose, we can, we can find refuge, we can find security and contentment in that. And I think we'll be well, our way, well on our way in understanding how we can have this godliness and contentment and why that's great gain. And we'll move away from this idea of it's actually in money that we trust to really it is in God that we trust. It's a, a few more verses here. In verses 17 and following, Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age. He's going to do a little play on words with this word rich. Those who are materially wealthy in this present age, not to be high-minded or haughty or proud. How often that comes with wealth. Those who are rich in this present age, not to be proud, nor to trust in the, their uncertain riches 
history has clearly revealed the uncertainty with wealth, but rather in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, to distribute, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. It's interesting that Paul mentions twice this good confession. Twice he also mentions this phrase, laying hold on eternal life. He says it once in verse 12. He says it again here in verse 19. That word to lay hold on means to seize, like apprehend, actually grasp, grasp something. It's, like, it's, it's used as a metaphor in this case, right? You can't actually grasp eternal life. But that's the kind of like urgent language or um, extreme language that Paul is trying to express to Timothy. Like get a grip on this eternal life. Lay hold on it. Seize it for what it's worth. And I think maybe in part what this means is really believing what Jesus says in John 10.10. 10. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That word abundant um, has a range of meanings, but within that, the meaning of that word, it can mean of superior quality and or it can mean overflowing quantity. And I think it's appropriate to attribute both those definitions or all of, that, of, of the semantic range of that word abundant to what Jesus is describing here as the life that he has come to give those that are a sheep. A life that is superior in quality and overflowing with quantity. It's that superlative, perfect, rich life that's found in meaningful relationships with God and others. We are relational beings and we find meaning and joy in relationships. And this idea of laying hold of that eternal life, to me, that's the treasure, right? That's the, that's the heavenly treasure of being able to have these relationships without the fetters of sin. That's contentment. That's, that's a devotion to God. When we realize that, when we're devoted to God and we have that contentment, I think we, we understand that is great gain. That is the true treasure. And so again, we move from in money we trust to in God we trust. Who, as Paul says, gives us richly all things to enjoy. And Paul you know, in, 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 encouraged these, th those that are wealthy, those that have material goods. He says, be rich in good works. And his argument is that they would store up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, right? Generously giving and thereby kind of wisely investing in this eternal life that you're supposed to lay hold on. A few, a few uh, Bible classes back, it, it was on giving. And I think a lot of good ideas were kicked around. And, but the, like, the nagging question was, well, how much are you supposed to give, right? And you cite the widow who gave all that she had, and you cite the rich man who didn't want to give anything, and then you have the, the Macedonians who gave to the point where it hurt, and you have other people that are... Anyways, it's all over the board, right? How much are we to give? And uh, after that Bible study, Michelle... Um, shared with me a, a really good quote from C.S. Lewis on this. And then ironically, Joe actually texts me the same quote, um, I think a couple days later. And so I think it's appropriate to read. Um, I think Lewis kind of helps push us in the right direction here. So how much are we to give? H how, rich are we to, are so we, how rich are we supposed to be in good works? C.S. Lewis writes, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. There's a couple things I want to bring out here. One is, I think he's onto something pretty good. I think we can nod our heads in agreement that that's consistent with the biblical, um, like the Macedonians, for example, right? Paul praises the Macedonians. The biblical principle or, or the model or example that's praised in the scripture that they gave to the point where it hurt. And I think C.S. Lewis is getting to that, right? That we, we give to the point where we actually feel it. The, 
The other thing, though, maybe what I don't like about what C.S. Lewis says is just that. We give to the point where we feel it. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. There's a point of contention in my mind here with that. If you want to do something, you want to do it because of the joy, satisfaction, pleasure of, of that thing, right? And let's say that thing is a good thing. It's not something bad or evil or, or, you know. It's a good thing. I want it. I want to put, whatever, the cinnamon and sugar and the raisins and all that kind of stuff on my oatmeal. I don't want this bare oatmeal and these bare necessities. I want a little spice in life, right? So I want this good thing. I want this pleasure. I want to enjoy this good thing. But C.S. Lewis is saying there should be times where you want to do that, you want to participate, you want to have that experience or whatever it is, but you can't because your charitable expenditure excludes it. So at that point, I feel like that's kind of a killjoy. I'm losing the joy and satisfaction or whatever it is that I wanted from doing this thing. I'm losing that. I think we all can admit to that because I can't do it because I've been giving away too much. But I think this is where we need to get to. This is where I need to get to. There ought to be things that we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them, but not for want of joy and contentment. Because what we're discovering is that it's more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, the little bit of joy and pleasure and and experience and contentment or whatever that is I'm pursuing by doing this one thing, that disappears because I don't have the money to do it. But the joy and contentment and purpose and security and satisfaction that I get from actually giving the money away that excluded that thing far outweighs that loss. That's the argument that Jesus makes that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Right? The, 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 it is something that I'm losing for sure, but the little that I'm losing is nothing to be compared to that which I'm gaining. And so Paul is making the argument that godliness with contentment is great gain. One point is that we can participate in that gain, that joy, here on earth as we realize that it's more blessed to give than to receive. But even more so, as Paul ends this, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that there's even even more joy on the other side of death, right? We are making a a wise investment by the way that we invest now, right? To, to, To realize as that investment matures the joy that will be had on the other side. I want to conclude with just a couple verses here. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. And Jesus did that for the joy that was set before him. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. That's a beautiful, you know, description of how the grace of God has flowed through Jesus to us. We are recipients of that. And to end Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give.
dear heavenly and gracious Father, we are so thankful to be here in your house today to uh, have the ability to freely worship um, with you, Lord, together with other believers. We know that um, it is such a privilege to do so, and uh, just the ability to own a Bible and to be able to read it, Lord, um, it is something that with contentment we forget about um, in this side of the world that there are other people who don't have the abilities that we do to gather freely in your name or those who are even persecuted, let alone just for owning a Bible, Lord. We, we pray for those um, living those lifestyles that they would continue to look to you, Lord, for, for that strength. And um, in this message that we heard today about um, being content with what we have, Lord, we pray that we would look to you for all things, and we know that we are to be thankful in all things, Lord, and through all things we have that you will bless us. We thank you for this message and for this day that you provided, Lord, and I just ask for a special blessing upon the noon meal that you have provided for us, Lord. I pray for a blessing upon those that have prepared it and that it would be nourishing to our bodies, Lord. I lift this up to you and pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Number 222 M220. You know, I like my oatmeal with honey. And the other day, as um, I sat down to a, my bowl of oatmeal with honey, um, I thought about that bowl. You know, when you, Lori makes a big batch, and then we put it in containers, and we kind of eat that throughout the week. And when you get down to that last bit, you know, if you take what you normally would take, well, then there's going to be not enough for the next time, you know. So you just have to take it all. And that bowl was probably three-quarter full. And I thought, you know, I've been listening to stories of faith and courage recently. This is a, um, a, a, set, a, a set of um, recordings put together by the sister church 
of just accounts of believers, especially back in Europe after the war and, and all the struggles and strife that they went through. And recently I had listened to the account of the Walter family who, uh, they were German, but they were born and raised in Yugoslavia. And so right at the end of the war, when it was pretty clear that um, the Axis powers were losing, um, the government of Yugoslavia rounded up all the German people even though they were Yugoslavians, they rounded up all the German people. And Sister Elizabeth was one of these and her family. And they basically put them in camps. Um, at, at first they had hopes that, you know, within a few weeks they'd just release them and everything would be okay. But after months it became clear that they put them in camps to die and starve. And as I listened to this account and I listened to uh, the, the um, miracles that, happened with the Walter family as they came out, and I won't go into the detail there, I looked at that bowl of oatmeal and I thought to myself, that would probably sustain five people today with the amount that they were really getting. Just to reread um, verse 17, 18, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they might lay hold on eternal life. In that um, story was also the account as, as uh, miraculously they were delivered uh, from the camps, at least the Walter family, that they had nothing. They had no country to go to. Yugoslavia wouldn't have them. Um, they had nothing. But yet, a couple times in there it says, but for the generosity of the brothers from Switzerland and from the United States, you know, they get some socks. They get some clothes. They just get the littlest bit just to sustain them. And they were so happy and so joyful. And when we were thinking of, you know, what can we do? You know, when we're made known of those, those troubles and those uh, needs, you know, not wants, but needs in the congregation or people that are true, that we lay up for ourselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay, that we might lay hold on eternal life when we think about, you know, the miser, he buries the, the gold in the dirt. And he, that's, that's important to him, right? And, you know, if you look up the world's greatest miser, you know, some woman who basically lived in a cold apartment through the winter. She wouldn't turn on the heat. Uh, she ate cat food and she died with millions in the back, bank back in the 20s or 30s, I think it was, right? Um, she just wouldn't spend, right? But when we think of, well, why are we saving up money for retirement, right? Well, we don't want to be homeless. You know, we don't want to have to live on the street and be cold and uh, be fighting the wind and the elements and the evildoers that are out on the street looking to take advantage of, um, of the poor and needy. But yet, truthfully, as we are, as Christians, should be retiring our um, retirement plan is heavenly. We're looking forward to that. And that's where we need to be saving for. Let's conclude in prayer. Lord, thank you again for all that you've given us. Be with us. Help us to enjoy the fellowship and the food. In Jesus' name.